Hey, Rising Church, welcome to uh, another round of Groves as we continue our series. I really kind of start this series. Last week was more of an intro uh, as we start diving into the content of Revelation here on, in our Groves. Um, on Sunday mornings, as I've mentioned, we're trying to tackle main, the main themes and kind of really it's kind of like a first time through, uh, kind of covering the, the bigger picture of things. And then in Groves, we're going to kind of follow up uh, starting with chapter one this week and just kind of follow up behind what we're doing on Sunday morning to kind of fill in some of the the gaps and fill in some of the cracks and uh, some of those different areas that might be better for discussion than we can do on a Sunday morning. Um, and so I don't know how you answered the question here this uh, during your Grove about, um, you know, where you're at on the, the one to 10 scale when it comes to uh, your knowledge and your understanding of Revelation. If you're like, I don't know anything, I'm a zero or how many guys put up like, I'm an eight. I got eight fingers here uh, on how much you know. Uh, but really kind of the danger, as I've been saying throughout the series on Sunday mornings, is if we think we can figure out everything and we want to know all the details and all the answers to everything, which is it's kind of why uh, every single week, pretty much for the last four or five Sundays, I've started off with these passages in Isaiah and Ecclesiastes. You know, the one in Isaiah is saying, God's ways are higher than our ways and God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts as far as the earth is from the heavens. Uh, and this idea that God's ways, you know, there's, there's just no way for us to think that we're going to be able to comprehend everything there is to know about God or the end times. Uh, and then this passage from Ecclesiastes, which I've you know said over and over and over again, uh, no one can fathom. There's no way that anybody can fathom what God has done from beginning to end what God has done, what God is currently doing, and what God will do. It's just, it's just beyond our comprehension. And so I think going into the series, again, as we dive into our grows, we really have to continue that idea of humility uh, and that there's some stuff that we're just not going to be able to answer, uh, which is why you might get frustrated in this series because we're not going to go verse by verse by verse by verse and what does this word mean and what does this imagery mean? Uh, because on some of those and the ones that I'm probably not going to dig down into, we're just not, we just don't know. Uh, and we could literally spend weeks and months trying to untackle every single one of these things. And at the end of it, you're just going to be like, well, that was our best theory. Uh, and so I'd rather focus on the things that we do know rather than things that we don't know. Uh, and really kind of get down deep on some of these things that we really need to think through as we look at the bigger picture. Again, stepping back and looking at the impression that's being painted and not get so preoccupied with the specific brushstrokes and the details. What's the bigger impression? Because uh, John, as we're going to talk about throughout the series, he doesn't even know what he's seeing half the time. Uh, how is he supposed to explain what he's seen? Uh, if you're coming from the first century and you're looking at something in the 21st century, how do you explain it? How do you explain a helicopter? Uh, how do you explain airplanes? Uh, so from his mind, he's got to come up with something that is like what he can see. And so a lot of that is confusing to us because it's confusing to him. Um, and so we're going to do the best we can. Uh, but I actually want to start off with an idea that not even in Revelation. So today we're, we're, we're going out of Revelation in order to kind of get us kicked off. And I, hopefully it'll give you some food for thought. Because again, this passage, I keep going over again, Ecclesiastes 3, no one can fathom what God has, has done from beginning to end. And I want to read you what's right around that passage. Because I've been kind of waiting to share this until we got to Grove. <coughs> and he says this, and one verse ahead, in, in verse 11. He says, he, God, God has made everything Everything beautiful in its time. There's a time when everything will be beautiful in that sense, where it will be completed. It'll be what it's supposed to be. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. This idea that God has placed in mankind, in our heart, in our soul, this idea there's something bigger than us. There's something eternal. There's something that's forever in us. And we are aware of that. Uh, and so it's in there, but we don't have the ability to comprehend it because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our ways. And no one can fathom what God has done. And so, but God has placed this idea of eternity and there is a time for everything and everything will be made beautiful in its proper time. If you know Ecclesiastes chapter three, uh, it actually is a pretty significant passage. It's one of the, the lyrics is a modern rock song or not modern anymore, I guess, but modern in the sense of eternity. Uh, in fact, it's probably the rock song that has the oldest lyrics of any rock song in the world. Uh, if you don't know, it's the song by the birds from 1965. Uh, they're the ones that made it famous. Um, Ecclesiastes three, one through eight. And I just want to read it to you, and then I want us to go back and look at it in the context of Revelation and how God makes everything beautiful in his time, but there's no way for us to fathom all that. It says, there is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep 
and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time of peace, or for peace. And he's saying, look, there's an appointed time. There's an, a season, an occasion for all these things. And you're going to experience all these things in your life. That's what makes life. It's, it's this combination of all these kind of extremes and kind of going back and forth between all these things. And sometimes they happen to us concurrently. And so that's kind of, that's what he's talking about. This is Solomon and all of his wisdom talking about life as he's at the end of his life, looking back and saying, there's just a time and a season and, and for all these different things. So it's not like one is exclusive and one is good or one is bad. It's like, just, it's just life. And what I want us to do is just kind of take this idea of what we just read and put it in the perspective of God and when it comes to the end times and put it on him. There is a time, an appointed season, when it's necessary for things to be born and for things to have their life taken away. To plant and to uproot those plants, to sow seeds and to reap the seeds, right? In that sense, there's a time to kill. There's also a time to heal. There's a time for God to tear things down. And there's a time for God to build things up. There's a time to weep, a time to laugh. There's a time for us to mourn, a time for us to dance. There's a time to scatter stones. And really what that word means is to throw stones. There's a time for us to fling stones. And there's a time for us to gather the stones. It's like there's going to be both of those. Is that true of God when it comes to the end? There's a time for God to embrace. And there's a time for God to stop embracing. There's a time for God to seek and to search. And there's a time for God to give up. There's a time for God to keep. And there's a time for God to throw away and to cast off. There's a time for God to tear like an old piece of clothing and to tear it. And it's just, there's no good anymore. And there's a time for him to sew it back together and mend it. Just like there's a time for you to give things to goodwill or for, to take this shirt and rip it up and use it as rags. It's like, it's the same for God. There's a time for both of those are appropriate and have the opportune time. There's a time for God to be silent in that sense and maybe hold back. And there's a time for God to speak and speak loud. There's a time for God to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And the reason I bring this up is because I think I've mentioned this before. I think the biggest struggle for us when it comes to the end times is seeing Jesus as bigger than just the Lamb of God, but as the Lion of Judah, the rightful judge with the right and the authority to come and to judge. In fact, that's what he says later on in Ecclesiastes 3. He says this in verse 17. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, as he repeated earlier, under heaven, a time to judge every deed. I think if we're ever going to understand Revelation, we have to start with a lot of different things we've mentioned, but we got to start with this idea that God is righteous in judging. And there is a time for him to throw away and to not heal or to not mend and to toss out. And there's a time to kill. There's a time to be born. There's a time to judge. Uh, and basically when we get to the to Revelation and we talk about all these cries of the people crying out to God, when are you going to judge? When are you going to come? When are you going to put an end to all this? When are you going to end evil? And as we even saw this week in Revelation 8 and 9, he's like, it's time. It's time. Because there is a time for everything under heaven. And in its time, God makes everything beautiful, even judgment, in a sense, it's beautiful. Because he has to get rid of the evil, which is what we all want him to do. But we don't know what the cost is for him to do that, which is why he's like, hold on, just wait a little longer. Uh, and so hopefully this will all start to make sense as we start peeling back the layers of Revelation. And as we dig a little bit in, again, not getting preoccupied with the little details, but looking at the bigger impression of what's happening and why it's happening. And hopefully that will give us a clear picture of what God is up to. Um, so I, I think that's a good place for us to start as we begin uh, again today. You're going to be diving into Revelation chapter one uh, and kind of following up with what we talked about earlier. Some of these things you've already heard and you'll be able to discuss them now and some of it might be new. So uh, let's be praying that this is a great series. So good luck today.